ਗੁਰਦਾਸ ਮਾਨ ਜੀ ਦਾ ਚੇਅਰਪਰਸਨ ਆਫ ਦਾ ਸਟੂਡੈਂਟ ਸੈਮੀਨਾਰ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਕਮ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਆਈ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਆਈ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਜਸਵੰਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਹਾਂ ਡਿਸਟ੍ਰਿਕਟ ਹੋਲੀਵੇਲ ਡਿਸਟ੍ਰਿਕਟ ਆਫ ਦਾ ਜੀ ਸੈਮੀਨਾਰ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਕਮ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਆਈ ਰਿਟਰਨ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਜੀਸ਼ੀ ਅਗਰਵਾਲ ਜੀ ਹੋਲੀਵੇਲ ਸਪੀਕਰ ਆਫ ਟੂਡੇ ਸੈਮੀਨਾਰ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਕਮ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਆਈ ਰਿਟਰਨ ਸ੍ਰੀ ਸੰਜੇ ਦੂਸਰੇ ਕਰੇ ਕੇਡੀ ਜੀ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਕਮ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਰਾਈਟ I request our center president I I request our center president Dr. Yuvan Nand ji please come on the right our chapter president Dr. Sasi ji and our chairman of the research committee Sri Sri Nand ji please come on the right Near you guys, all the dignity of the time, please come forward for the item of the name.
you are the first chairman of National Assembly and the first chairman of Youth Pension Scheme Trust. And again, the first chairman, Kirtas Noda, in the city of Delhi, in He is an establishment author and a poet as well. Give me this. Chapter successfully organized environment system symposium at Lairport UND has last year had research foundation, Shikshar Ghan, Romani, and special lectures on water disease and Uttarakhand disaster with the cooperation of Sandra Research Foundation, Roma University, and Dini. Some students are speaking here, I think, from Roman University. And the, uh, we have this report to be published in soon in the special number of Saturday Patrons. Now, among the audience, we have some more dedicated scholars, writers to be mentioned. Professor S.S. Hargit is the director, Institute of UN UNESCO Studies, once headed by Dr. Nadim Rahman. Can we stand up, please? We have another writer, uh, Mr. Santosh Khanna, the editor of Vidhi Harki, dedicated to law and human rights, and uh, she, she has been in Parliament as senior officer. Can we stand up? Please have a seat. My role as the president of IDAI is over. To welcome the distinguished guest is over. I would like to say that the story of NGO, which I learned in Manchester University, UK, in 1982, along with my IDAI friends, is altogether changed in the present century. The management of Sri Prasya in Gita, that is good balance in all aspects, is still at work. Well, I am not going to speak on this subject as we have to listen to valuable speeches from our honorable speaker, guest of honor, and the chairperson as well. Thank you very much. Keep busy. I'll just say one thing more. We lack in love and affection nowadays. The time is changed. We have a हमारे समाज में इस समय जो स्थिति हो रही है, वैल्यूज नहीं, संस्कार नहीं, जिसकी वजह से हमें ये सेमिनार करनी पड़ रही है, वरना इसकी आवश्यकता ना पड़ती। सिविल सर्विस भी क्या रूप चेंज हो रहा है, रोल चेंज हो रहा है, आखिर क्या आवश्यकता है इसे? क्योंकि हम घरों में ना तो वैल्यूज देते ह एमबीए बनकर के आईएएस बनते हैं या विदेशों में जाते हैं लेकिन वे मानव जो बनना चाहिए जो रूप होना चाहिए वो नहीं हो पाता है इसीलिए भ्रष्टाचार जो हमारे मित्रा जी ने किताब लिखी है डॉक्टर मित्रा जी पुस्तक आपने पढ़ी होगी भ्रष्ट समाज हिंदी में भी है किताब मैंने काफी तो मैं समझता हूँ कि एक हमारे लिए मार्गदर्शक की तरह से किताब है तो इस तरह की काम जो हो रहे हैं मैं समझता हूँ कि हमारा ये आज का जो कार्यक्रम है मेरे साथी बैठे हुए हैं उनके बारे में मैं भी बोल रहा है तो वो श्री सीए 
मेरे बराबर में बैठे हैं एडमायर आई एडमायर माई टीम पर्टिकुलरली वो सेक्रेटरी वेरी चेयरमैन सी ए डीन दे आर एच ही हैज वर्क हार्ड टू ऑर्गेनाइज दिस सेमिनार इंफॉर्मेशन विद श्री सी ए सुनील अरोड़ा चेयरमैन रिसेप्शन कमेटी एंड अदर मेंबर्स नेम भी श्री राम मेहरोत्रा वाइस प्रेसिडेंट सी ए प्रमोद महेश्वरी वाइस प्रेसिडेंट श्री अनिल जैन जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी श्री योगेश कुमार जॉइंट सेक्रेटरी डॉक्टर अमित जैन श्री राज एंड अदर सॉफ्टवेयर आई शुड मैर देन एंड कॉम्प्लीमेंट टू फॉर द सक्सेस इन सुनिंग आर वी हैव गॉट वन एडिटर ऑफ सत्यता संस्कृति डॉक्टर योगेन्द्र शर्मा अरुण इज द चीफ एडिटर Uh, he's from Ruki, and he's our IPS member. And he's a big second member of the Sarasvati. She's sitting here. Give her a big hand. Now I have nothing to say, but just to convey to you the message of the hour. You know, this is lacking in the society. And I have traveled so many countries. I found. The best how they are suffering from the from the you know modern culture so far it is uh, it's coming to India in a very bad manner. Um, Dr. Yadav is also here. We have a amazing artist. And other friends are also here. I think I may not be to to everyone here. Uh, I think this is your family, you know. We have now big family. Our principal sir, just now, Dr. Sujeev uh, Persons, now I have been to know and we will discuss you, all of you, that in future also please do have association with this organization because this is, uh, we are going to have a soon next year that I will invite the people from Indian Women, known as Yema, and our chairperson, chairman, uh, our president, Dr. Yogesh President, uh, Dr. Yogendra Narayanji. Please be inspiring for uh, all of us, and I think under his guidance, so the next year will have a good occasion to be to be in Delhi, and that that will be the best time for all of us. That how our blood is being ignored in the world, and how they are facing a lot of problems. You know, they, but they speak Hindi. The language is Roman ka naam suna hoga apne. Aap naam kaan mein bishop aaj bhi nikla tha, Hindi mein bolne ja tum unko na. और उनकी चाल हो रही है उन्हें हॉलो कास्ट में उनको भी हिटलर ने घूम दिया था और उससे पहले जो है वो ये जूश थे वो तो समझ गए लेकिन हमारे ये लोग नहीं हैं ये नहीं समझे इनका बहुत बुरा हाल है इंदिरा गांधी बड़ा इंटरेस्ट लिया करते थे इसमें नेहरू जी भी लेते थे उसके बाद अटल बिहारी वाजपेयी के साथ मैंने कोई वर्ल्ड कॉन्फ्रेंस कराई यहाँ पर स्कूल में बैठे हुए हैं हम लोगों ने वर्ल्ड कॉन्फ्रेंस कराई थी उसके बाद उनके वो लोग आते थे लेकिन उनका कोई सुनने वाला नहीं मैं समझता हूँ वो हमारा भाषा की दृष्टि से हमारे जो लोग हमारे साथ हैं तो एक हज़ार वर्ष पहले की जो हिंदी है अगर वो देखनी है तो उनको उन्हें पढ़ना चाहिए उसके पहले भी सिकंदर बिस्ट्री बुक यहाँ से गया था वो सब कहानियाँ हैं मैं नहीं बोलूँगा ज़्यादा लेकिन मैं इनका संदेश आपको दे के देना चाहता हूँ और ये मेरा अपना सेक्रेट है हमने अपने दर से पूछा हमारा दर ये उन सब के लिए हमने अपने दर से पूछा दरवाजे से हमारा घर कहाँ है दर ने कहा सारा जहां जहां है दर ने कहा सारा जहां जहां है हमने सवाल किया बंधु सारा जहां कहां है दर का जवाब था क्या जहां जहां थैंक यू डॉक्टर साहब नाउ इनवाइट आवर सेंटर प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर गुंडा जी फॉर हिज इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ रिमार्क्स Esteemed uh, speakers on the dais and esteemed 
Yes. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the <coughs> sector of the NDSI and the and the members from outside. <coughs> and all the members present here. <clears throat> when the Delhi chapter came to me to take advice on holding a seminar and they wanted to know what is the topic on which the seminar should be held, I said one issue that is becoming very critical today is about the role of the civil services. Because as part of the government machinery, they have been recently subject to a lot of attacks. The entire government machinery has come under, under attack. And the credibility of governance has really taken a beating. So they decided to hold the seminar and to invite our distinguished speakers. Sri Ali Kumar said, just sign me up. He's the present cabinet secretary. He will be joining us in another 15-20 minutes also, because we wanted to hear the, the, the people who are incumbents of office today, as well as people who have been in the past. Sanjay Bhustadi is also here, he has been the voice of the Central um, Association of the IAS, and he would be also giving his views on this changing role of the civil services, apart from our distinguished galaxy of speakers like Mr. Prabhatma, former Chief Secretary, Mr. Chandan Mitra, he will give the outsider's viewpoint and also the viewpoint of the of the members of parliament and also Sri UC Agarwal. So this was the topic chosen. The credibility has raised questions on the functioning of the governance which includes both the elected representatives as well as the permanent executive. The civil services of today are very different from that of yesterday years. The civil services, while in the times of the British, till independence, their role was primarily maintenance of law and order and perpetuation of British rule, but after independence, there has been a radical change. The civil services had, after independence, for the first time, to work under elected ministers as under the constitution. The sovereignty of the British was substituted and replaced by the sovereignty of the people. <coughs> the concept of public servants, that is being servants of the public, became a hard reality for the civil servants after independence. The civil servants were no longer decision maker, as the IUCS used to be in the past, but became advisors to the decision makers that is the elected representatives and the council of ministers. The policy was made by the elected ministers and the civil servants' efficiency was recognized to the, to the measure in which he could effectively implement those policies. A planned economy with the five-year plans became a unique pattern of development of this country. I'm sure the speaker will speak on other aspects of the changing role. I would just like to highlight three or four in my introductory remarks. In view of the globalization, our civil servants' advisory role has also expanded. The civil servant today has not only to be well versed in the Indian Penal Code and the Criminal Procedure Code or the Evidence Code, which were the traditional laws to be implemented, but also with now with the WTO regulations, the import-export regulations, the laws of the sea, civil aviation regulations, financial markets, human rights, the working of the UNO, food and agriculture organization, intellectual property rights, and so on. His, his role has expanded, and he has to be well aware of all this. Therefore, therefore a civil servant today has to be multifaceted and to be well versed in all these issues. The civil services and the civil servants conduct and decision making is also now subject, which it was not there earlier, to intensive examination by the institutions like the Central Vigilance Commission and the Comptroller and Auditor General. In some cases, the judiciary has also started conducting 
in, in the investigations under its own supervision. The civil servants are operating, if I may say so, in an atmosphere of distrust. The media is also playing a very active role and is ready to highlight any mistakes or delinquent action <coughs> by the civil servants, whether they be of the IAS, the revenue services, the <coughs> etc. This was not so much in the past. The role of the civil servants has also changed because with the absolute control <coughs> of elected masters as given in the transaction of business rules of the central and state governments, the decision of the minister is final in the department. The civil servant has to fine tune the observance of law, rules and regulations with the political necessities of his elected heads of the department, heads of the ministry. The minister in turn is fed by information from his MLAs and MPs on whose support he is dependent. So the civil servant at all levels of governance, whether he is a district magistrate or a secretary, at all levels, they are persuaded to act as advisor, as advised by the politicians of face the threat of immediate transfers and punishments. When there is, of course, a blatant violation of law, the civil servant can say no. But when discretion is to be excised, the politicians of the ruling party usually prevail. A reference was made by Padmshri Dr. Shashi about the ethical need of the day. Yes, the ethical behavior of the civil servants is also the topmost priority <coughs> in a democracy. The Second Administrative Reforms Commission has defined that apart from the traditional civil uh, service values of efficiency, integrity, accountability, and patriotism, it is necessary for civil servants to inculcate and adopt ethical and moral values, including poverty in public life, respect for human rights, and compassion for the downtrodden, and commitment to their welfare. A draft public service bill was introduced in 2005, which included a set of values for public servants, but no progress has been made in its enactment so far. <coughs> I see governance evolving in a manner like Rostow used to explain the different stages of growth. Governance also has different stages of growth. First was, of course, governance itself. And I think that was introduced by the Britishers uh, in the modern concept from 1600 on, onwards when they governed India. They introduced governance as we know government. After independence, we, we uh, developed into what is, we can call a good and caring governance. A good and caring government. It has to uh, care for the welfare of the people. After 60 years, <coughs> and people are now realizing that what we need is ethical governance, a higher form of governance. And I'm sure as these various stages of evolution of governance come into being, different roles and different concepts of governance will come into being and different demands on the civil servants will also come into being. So friends, our distinguished speakers will speak on the changing role of the civil servant. The environment has changed rapidly. Why the civil servants, I would say, have by and large adjusted to the needs of the day and contributed to taking the country economically forward and preserve democracy, their role is bound to change further with advancement of technology, new challenges both within and outside the country, and the need to specialize in areas where they have to meet international challenges also. These are the changing facets of, of the civil servants and the demands that are required of them today. I will, these are my introductory remarks and I'm sure the panelists here, distinguished panelists, will further expand and give their own views also. And I hope it be an interesting and very educative uh, seminar that we are going to have today. I would like to congratulate the uh, Delhi chapter president, secretary, and all the members for organizing it in this grand manner. Thank you. Now I request the chairperson of the this seminar, Dr. Prabhupada.
Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, Dr. Shashi and Dr. Yogendra, they have given a very good introduction of what the subject is going to be. And I don't want to lose any time because I want to hear if Chandra Mitra, who has threatened to leave, so I'll request Dr. Chandan Mitra to express his views. NGOs, the 
deepening of democratic institutions with the setting up of the third layer of democracy, namely the panchayats, there is much closer examination and need for much greater interaction between the civil service bureaucracy at various levels and the people and their elected representatives. Before I come to the main point, I just um, also want to um, outline some, a bit of a historical background of the evolution of Indian bureaucracy since independence in terms of the anatomy of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy at one stage was the only interaction, the civil service was the only interaction between the ruler and the ruled in colonial India, or even before that. Because the ruler was too far. In the British period, the ruler was 7,000 miles away, sitting in London. And his or her appointed representatives, starting from the Governor General of Viceroy, right down to the district magistrate, were representatives of his majesty or her majesty and had to interact and had to interpret the government's uh, policies to the people, it was the only interview, there was no elected there in So there was an element of that superiority and superciliousness, a Maibab culture, which you may have heard of, the term Maibab culture, or Maibab government. The Maibab government was based on that, that a white man coming from 7,000 miles away, come riding horseback, through the villages, usually uh, natives who couldn't speak his language, who were in awe of such a person, but who would visit, who would actually uh, visit large parts of the country, take down meticulous notes. If, as a student of history, I've had the opportunity to read many district gazetteers, of, particularly of UP, where all these things are noted down in great detail. It was very helpful for succeeding generations. But there was this sense of detachment. They were not involved. The job of the bureaucracy then was basically to ensure law and order. Aman Chen, two times, they were, came under fire only when there was some disturbance. So basically, it was a policing and, and law, law and order administration job. Development was far from that. The district administration, the mainly British administration there, had to ensure not only that peace and tranquility was maintained, but also in the event of flood, in the event of drought, some relief was provided to the people. But the other job also was to keep communication lines open, troops had to move, goods and services had to move for the services of the, of the colonial regime. That was basically the role of the bureaucracy, it was pretty limited, and this is what continued almost in the 40s. In the 40s, the situation was disturbed as the national movement gained strength, and there was constant pressure on the administration to ensure law and order. People were turning rebellious, and even in the administration, the junior ranks, the Indians who were in the service, were not 100% with the British regime. There was a reference to you know, the transition uh, between the, from the time of the British to the Indian regime, <coughs> that where reporting to the political master has become part of the job and is enshrined in the constitution. I remember there was a time the one district minister was reporting to his superior in Lucknow, to the governor in Lucknow, I think it was at the time of Malcolm Haley, <coughs> that uh, saying that the, the fortnightly report said that there's a lot of unrest among the police yeah, because Congress uh, politicians are going around saying this is in the period 1937, 38, 9 when there was an elected Congress government in power after the government of India. So the English district uh, magistrate writing that there's a lot of unrest because these nationalist leaders are holding rallies and looking at policemen saying, ye police wale to ab hamare nokar. Nokar hai ye 
So the DM is very upset. He is not used to hearing this language. And in North India, the term locker is generally a term, you know, you know, we treat a person very poorly. And till the other day, he writes to me. So they were the masters. They were the masters and they lorded over everyone. And all these fellows were, uh, have been sent to jail for everything. So they found them of jail, they have become uh, part of the government and they are calling the policemen locker. At this rate, tomorrow they will call us also locker. He expresses the fear. But this <coughs> the writing was over. You know what happened? Things changed. It is not a master-servant relationship anyway. Never is. Between the politician and the bureaucracy, politician and the police, it is never, it cannot be. The politician, after all, knows that he is a temporary person. His job is not permanent. Five years, and then only those who are very lucky or those who have done enough um, back to Maska Lagawi, to use a group term, become ministers. <laughs> And then, when this government goes, they go. Whereas the bureaucracy is formal. There's a big, big difference. And, there, and that's an important. That is, that also it must be. Well, after all, the continuity of governance, the continuity of governance and its evolution, from governance to caring governance to ethical governance, this has to be actually undertaken by the bureaucracy itself. <laughs> There will never be continuity in the political regime. So this is something I would urge all of you to keep in mind, especially I think the younger people who are trying to bureaucracy. They must know uh, the major role, a major role that is bestowed upon them is to examine how to make this transformation. They must evolve. They must codify. They must suggest how to do this. But anyway, come back to what my main point, that from the Maiba situation, even when the political power changed hands in 1947, <coughs> the character of the bureaucracy did not have a whole much change. The color of the skin changed. Kahits were replaced by those whom we derisively called the brown side. But because Many of them were part of the old system, and even the newer people who came in were part of the same culture. The elitism of the bureaucracy remained the same. It was elitist, and it continued to be detached for a long time. But our political leaders, they were morally better people. And I say this, I mean, it's all serious. People like Pandit Nehru, Dalmaro, Shastri, Gurdaila, Nanda, and others of the time. They were morally upright people, most of them. And therefore, they also interfered less. The pressure of the bureaucracy, the pressure that we face today, did not exist. But they were comfortable because they were also, the political leaders were also steeped in an earlier culture in which the British were masters, British were culturally dominant. So that culture continued, they were comfortable with English-speaking bureaucrats and that was it basically. The nature of the bureaucracy didn't change, although it changed slowly, I would say it didn't change, but it changed very, very slowly. Now, but yes, in those days, at least in the late 60s and early 70s, the pressure of the bureaucracy to do the bidding of political masters, particularly political caste, carry out political caste, was not there. Either on the police or intelligence or the bureaucracy. <coughs> but then in the late 60s, when the political stability, or I would say the continuity, was broken for the first time, as a footnote, I would just want to remind the here, that in 67, most of you will recall it, that for the first time, the Congress party lost control of a large number of states, in particularly in Northern India. It was said that the Punjab Mail, <coughs> from Howrah to Amritsar, did not have to touch a Congress state in between. Bengal, Bihar, UP, Punjab, 
that sterilization targets were met. And the police indulge in absolutely wanton excesses and the bureaucracy was silent. You don't win. There were few who stood up, but very few. It was not the bureaucracy's job. It is not the bureaucracy's job to stand up and you know kind of come on the streets and oppose the political establishment. Yes, they can argue in those rooms, they can tell the political masters that this is not right. What you're doing is going to be very you know, injurious to the system and so on. But you cannot, I mean, you are not going to argue. You're overruled, you're overruled. And this system goes on, it's not only words. In my newspaper also, once the editor overrules, editor's ruling stands. Nobody can continue. Um, and if you don't agree, resign and leave. But as long as you're in service, you have to accept that. So the bureaucracy faced these dilemmas, I would say, for the first time. Since so many years, for more than 100 years, the bureaucracy was at par. But after 67 and all this political churning that happened in the country, bureaucracy faced these challenges. To skip from there, because you see, that has, I would say, the post-67 or 67 to 77, crucial decade in India. That has defined, in a sense, that has defined the role, the new role of the bureaucracy. And bureaucracy has changed there. It keeps changing, but within that paradigm, within those paradigms, that yes, there is a political role. There is a political role for the bureaucracy that is now assumed. That there's a role of the bureaucracy, even in what I would say, quote unquote, dirty jobs that have to be done. That includes, in some states, I'm told, and I wrote a book on this as uh, very uh, thankfully mentioned, uh, it's called Corrupt Society, which I've focused a lot on the UP bureaucracy in particular. And when they, you are compatriots, sir. Uh, uh, they took a poll to identify the most corrupt bureaucrat you will call. They had a voting actually on this. Uh, they did not announce the result, but everybody made it clear. Enough was leaked to the media to know who had won that poll hands down. <laughs> I will not reveal the name, it may embarrass some people. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is what happened. You know, this is whole, the steel frame, the structure, the stiff upper lip, so to speak, that was. Shattered, shattered fully and finally, um, and has been recovered and will not recover. They have to change. In 1989, the government of the day decided to implement the Mandal Commission report. It was hanging fire for a long time, but 89, finally, the government said. Whether it was good or bad, I have my views on it, but again, I will not. Put them out here, but only to say that the social composition of the Indian bureaucracy underwent the change. It is still underwent. Its full ramification will become clear another 10 years down the line when the post Mandal entrants become you know, right, to the, right to the top. Many of them come from very different social backgrounds compared to those who were in the bureaucracy earlier. So the Elitism that I have mentioned, the aristocratic temperament, and you even not use them like elite or aristocracy, but at least people who are from well-to-do backgrounds, they were educated, generations of bureaucrats, grandfather, father, to son, lovely oil paintings uh, in their houses showing uh, their um, uh, grandfather who was obviously bestowed at some point, Rai Bahadur or something. It was like an army in a sense. Well, the bureaucrats also went on from generation to generation. That, that thing changed. You had absolutely new people from the newly emerging social classes who had also become very affluent, but they were largely rural people. Many of them with non-English education backgrounds. It was a very sharp change. I remember I went to address some of them, young recruits, and the biggest problem it was the foreign service people were actually, I was addressing the foreign service people and the post director told me, Mr. Mitra, my biggest problem is 
teaching them how to hold a fork at night. A problem I've never faced anymore. <laughs> well, you know, I, we should, must not, we must not uh, take this lightly. It is not going to be a sight to anyone. But dear the real people of this country, how long could, could we have left them out? They had to come in sooner or later. And I would say to the credit of the bureaucracy, the very big credit, I'm coming to the um, end of my uh, points, this very great credit of the bureaucracy is that this assimilation process, assimilation process has been conducted peacefully and without any serious unrest. Thode ball is there to chalte rete hain, but you know, you should not exaggerate. The bureaucracy in India is, I would say, very adept in ensuring a peaceful transition to the changing realities and demands. And the new people are coming to the civil services, many of them through the DCS, some direct through SWIS, IFS, and other services. They have been assimilated, it will take some time. But it has changed, the character has changed. Character has changed. There are value systems of the Zipa. But I think this is something which we have to uh, accept and deal with. In a sense, it is also good that this change is taking place. Because then, you know, when we deal with bigger problems, and I am just coming to them, I think the exposure and understanding of rural realities is much, much better. So from the time that the uh, Angres um, used to come, Gorenda Sawar, and treat the natives with some amusement and do some charity, no such a point. So I think that's such a big, and then, but the culture basically continues with minor changes um, here and there, till this, all this churning process, first in 67 and then post-1989 came. Now he will stabilize. But yes, new challenges, new challenges have emerged. See, independent functioning in a non-partisan manner, this is our serious challenge. Because political interference is very much there. I don't need to go into details. The case of Mr. Ashok Khemka in Haryana, Yoga Shakti Nagpal, which is referred to also here in UP, will show that how there is a conflict is arising. And Mr. P.C. Parak's letter, which has just come to light, all this shows the conflict between the political establishment and those sections of bureaucracy who refuse to crawl when asked to bend. Both the section, though Abhitak Girgira Nehra, Bolo Tapka hai, Unke Bees Me, Ho Sangar Shai, Ho Mai Samasta Ho, Kya Amin Sinti Aur Pardai Hai. और इसके लिए आप सबको सचेत रहना और खास ये जो नए लोग आ रहे हैं उनकी ट्रेनिंग में ये बात आनी चाहिए कि ऐसी हम सिद्धि जब आए तो उसे कैसे दी करना चाहिए दुर्गा शक्ति आसपास के इस पर्टिकुलर एलिट आश्रम वेर यू नो आई एम नॉट गोइंग टू दिस वेस्ट वाज रिमूव्ड और सस्पेंडेड बिकॉज़ ऑ and what, what do the bureaucrats do under these circumstances? And what lessons do they take from this? This, as I said, right now, you have to decide. Yes, the media is very alert today, and I'm very proud of the Indian media for all its follies, all its faults, all the shaking and shouting. Without the media, many of these issues would not have come to light, would not have come to light. So some excesses will happen every time a new phenomenon happens. So yes, media sometimes indulges in excesses. But the fundamental contribution is that the rights and duties of citizens has been made very, very clear through the media and people have a friend in the media. When there is injustice or oppression, whether it is to an IAS officer or to the uh, Chaprasi or to the Chelawala, where do you turn to? And that is where I come to the final point that 
independent functioning in a non-partisan manner, restoration of idealism, which is very important, that I think the seniors and those who died must instill in the younger people, the value systems that Sajiji was talking about. The how to, how to at least fight corruption. I'm not saying bureaucracy can end corruption. It is not bureaucracy's fault. I am very often bureaucracy is helpless. I have always believed that look, no one or two people or no no one part of the system can correct it. At least in corruption, if there is that much a value in a bureaucrat's mind, then I will not be corrupt. And I will not allow corruption knowingly happening anywhere. What is beyond you is beyond. So at least it's practical both somewhere at it, still not. Challenging. But finally, there is, you see, with all these changes, the final thing that has to come in is the sensitivity. Today, the biggest problem, as the Prime Minister himself has correctly identified, is the problem of left wing resurgency. In Chhattisgarh, you all know, Jharkhand, parts of West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra and some other states also. The challenge posed by these uh, infantile disorders, as Lenin had called them, this is a challenge to our democracy, it is a challenge to our entire system. But much of it is of our own creation. It is our inability.